Welcome back, party people. Mike here with The Social Life of Language, and today we are covering an article by a group of scholars that have published tons on dual language bilingual education programs in the United States. The title of the article is The Disinclusion of Latino Interests from Utah's Dual Language Education Boom. Okay, so if you're anything like me, you might be thinking, why Utah? Why of all places should we turn to Utah to tell us anything about Latinos or Spanish dual language programs? That's actually a really good question. Let's find out. Okay, so first, some historical context. In the year 2000, Utah became another state that enacted English-only legislation, where English is treated as the official language of education. Now, back then, but also even today, Spanish continues to be framed as this primary threat to the monolingual dreams of many conservative Americans. Nevertheless, starting in 2007 and 2008, Utah was the first to standardize its state-level language planning strategy with dual language education as its centerpiece. And in that process, the state developed a compelling one-size-fits-all approach to dual language programs or DL programs. It was so successful, in fact, that many states from across the US started creating copycat policy or were at least in some way influenced by what the authors have been calling the Utah model of dual language bilingual education. In this article, our authors analyzed written policy and marketing material from about 2008 to 2015. And there are two main sections in this article. First, in analysis, analysis of the actual written policy, and second, an analysis of the marketing and promotional material that circulated at the time. So let's briefly talk about the written policy part. But I'm really going to focus on the marketing stuff, the promotional material. So I ended up sending an email to the authors and asked them if they had any pictures of the marketing stuff at the time. And no joke, I think they sent me everything they used while they were writing this article. So I want to show you as much as that material as possible because it really is one thing to read about it. But when you actually see the marketing material. I don't know. It just hits differently. Like, honestly, I already liked this article. That's why I'm making a video on it. But once I got all the stuff and could see everything myself, for me, it took this article to the next level. Okay, so onto the written policy part. Our authors uncovered two main constituencies. And by the word constituency, they mean an identifiable interest group. In this case, we see one constituency that was interested in bilingual education for purposes of equity and heritage language maintenance. And we can kind of predict that the Latinx parents are going to mostly fall into this camp, into that constituency. So for short, let's just call this the equity slash heritage group. Now on the other side, we have another group that we might call the world languages constituency, a group that includes parents interested in bilingual education for purposes of giving their children a competitive edge in the future or the opportunity to say they speak a world language on their college resumes or job application. Now remember, these are the main two constituencies, but they're not exclusive groups, meaning that some parents might align a little bit with both groups. But what we're interested in is how the world languages group was prioritized and the equity heritage group was deprioritized, or as they state in the abstract. Our analysis revealed a pattern of centering the interests of the white English dominant majority and those without an ethnic connection to the target language while marginalizing or silencing Latino interests. So let's look at just one example of a written Utah policy. Specifically, let's talk about how bilingual education programs could be structured, and then let's look at how Utah prefers to structure their programs. Now, in in some classrooms and programs, maybe ones we might call more progressive leaning, the teacher might use the student's first language about 90% of the time with about 10% of the time used to slowly add in the second language. Or another way to say this is the student is taught bilingually through both languages. Now, this is totally different from an immersion style program, which kind of reminds me of a sink or swim method. So overall, in these 90%, 10% programs or 
90-10 programs, teachers use the language the child knows and then slowly incorporates English more and more. And over time, as more and more English is learned, the more English takes over as being the main classroom language. Now, there is a ton of research that supports the effectiveness of this program. Now, unfortunately, when this article was written, these 90-10 programs did not receive any extra state support from Utah. Instead, Utah exclusively offered extra state support to programs that followed a strict 50-50 model. 50% 50 in English and 50% in the other language. We can see this described in a promotional flyer from 2015. All state-sponsored schools with dual language immersion programs are required to implement the 50-50 model and use two teachers, one who instructs exclusively in the target language for half the day, and a second who teaches in English for the remainder of the day. Now, when you look at this on paper, the policy seems logical and almost commonsensical. Both languages are given equal time. The results, however, are not equal. In the classroom itself, the 50-50 model gives a huge advantage to students who already know English. In other words, the 50-50 model gives priority to the world languages constituency because many of their children already know English. Now here we gotta remember that bilingual education was at one point in history meant to close the achievement gap between English and non-English users. And those activists from the civil rights era were concerned with attaining educational equity. Now flash forward to today, this is really just not the vibe coming out of these written policies from Utah. And it very much seems like the state is trying to attract folks from the already dominant classes in Utah. And most of them would likely be marked as white Americans and already English speakers. And the whiteness of this constituency becomes super visible when you watch the dual language promotional video Utah was using at the time. When I was watching the video, I really got that feeling of, wow, this was 10 whole minutes of like a couple of token non-white students with most of the video images focusing on white children. Now we're going to talk about this video way more a little bit later. So there are many ways that the world languages folks are prioritized in policy. That 50-50 model being a major one. But now I want to switch to the marketing stuff. Now remember this article is pointing out which constituency these marketing materials were designed to attract. The authors uncover two central strategies used to attract the world languages language constituency. Those strategies being hierarchization and textual silencing. So let's start with the hierarchization first. Now establishing the hierarchy in this material is kind of subtle, depending on who you are and what kind of things you're sensitive to. But the marketing stuff doesn't really just blatantly say English is more important. Instead, the marketing material promotes what it considers to be the norms of American citizens. And it centers these norms and then positions everything else as secondary or as exotic or both. To be clear, in the United States, an idealized English monolingualism is considered the norm to many people, even if this idealized monolingualism doesn't actually exist. Now, when we really think about something like the 50-50 model, where ideally both languages are treated equally, then neither language should be considered secondary. Nevertheless, in these programs, English is presented as the norm or the center, and other languages are positioned as L2s or second languages. So, for example, when you position Spanish as the L2, it quite literally establishes what the authors are calling the secondariness of languages other than English. Here is what the Utah State Office of Education website said at the time. Utah's dual language immersion program offers a rich bilingual experience for young learners when their minds are developmentally best able to acquire a second language. Instruction is divided between two high quality creative classrooms, one English and one in the second language. Chinese, French, German, Portuguese, or Spanish. Okay, so we sense the hierarchy here. Let's move on to exoticizing strategies, which right away we gotta acknowledge that when you frame something as exotic, you are implying a deviation from the norm. In this case, the American norm. So yes, exoticization can be used as a method 
of establishing and maintaining hierarchies. Let's look at some brochures from these dual language programs. Now remember, while these kinds of material often have a celebratory tone, it nevertheless positions a language like Spanish and also Spanish speakers as themselves exotic. Let's take a look at this Spanish language brochure because it's, um, uh, it's, it's, it, it's something. Okay, so this is meant to be a printed trifold brochure. So it looks a little strange flattened out on screen, but you know, whatever, we're smart, we'll get it. Okay, so on this Spanish DL flyer, we got kids in Flocorico and mariachi regalia because, well, you know, Mexican children always dress like this when they go to school every day. So on the first page of the brochure, it says, offering the gift of a second language. Okay, but let's think about that phrasing. The priority is not students who already speak Spanish. It's aimed at the world languages constituency who are assumed to already have English as their first language. So it appears that this marketing brochure is aimed at parents who want their kids to be competitive on the global marketplace. I mean, look at these quotes. We got phrases like doing business in other cultures and be competitive in the world marketplace and multilingual workforce in the world economy. I mean, even some entity named the Utah World Trade Center is, I guess, sponsoring this or supporting this initiative in some way. So in this brochure, we got the production of hierarchies and exoticization. Now notice in these pictures that we don't get anything that looks like an American Spanish speaking place. Remember places like California or Puerto Rico or Florida or New York. From these photos I'm guessing it's designed to invoke the feeling of Mexico. Okay, but how are the other foreign languages treated in these brochures? Do they use the same kinds of caricatures? Well, sort of, but in ways that do not necessarily exoticize the actual speakers of the language. For example, this is the French brochure, which has a generic cartoon picture of the Eiffel Tower, a globe that says the world speaks French, and then some white looking kids learning in a classroom. And here is another photo used in the French brochure. Okay, so we got some more children that will likely be marked as white, in classrooms making thinking gestures. In other words, this could be read as French in the classroom, or even a subtle, this could be your child kind of vibe. Now, when we look at the German DL brochure, we kind of get that same vibe. We got more kids having fun in the classroom. And again, I'm reading these children as probably white. Oh, but what about the Chinese language programs? Because that population is often stigmatized as well. Here is the flyer, but let's focus on the photos again. We got this photo from the classroom, which was probably chosen because of what the teacher was wearing and maybe the phenotypic qualities that would likely be read as Chinese or Asian. But also notice that white lady in the back kind of poking her head in. Maybe that could symbolize a happy parent. And again, I'm reading that parent as probably white. The other photo is a little more exoticizing and equally complex. However, notice that the child in the center could probably be read as black American. And then you have two children in the background who could likely be read as white American. And then the child who was almost completely cropped off is probably the one child that would be phenotypically read as Asian American. Maybe. Either way, you see how this gives the vibe of this is an American classroom. Or maybe this could be your American child. This could be you as a proud American parent. And finally, how about the Portuguese program? Well, we get a picture of a bird, a brown kid with a soccer ball. But most importantly, I would say children in the classroom learning. Now, in comparison to the Spanish DL brochure, to me, you get the this is what children in Mexico look like vibe. That is potentially so exoticizing that I doubt it gives off the this could be your children type of vibe. Plus, there just isn't any photos of classroom learning. Kinda seems like Spanish doesn't offer anything conducive to learning. So in this kind of marketing, the messages can be subtle and not so subtle. For example, if I were a Mexican American parent in Utah, I would have looked at this Spanish DL program brochure. I would have rolled my eyes hard. I mean, for real, from those photos, all that's missing is like a cactus and a pinata and a sombrero. No, actually, that kid has a sombrero, right? 
Yes, never mind. Actually, we do have a sombrero on there. And finally, there is another strategy used in this marketing stuff, and it's what the authors call textual silencing. But for this video, let's just call it silencing because we're really looking at absences of certain kinds of information that could have been delivered, yes, via text, but also pictures and even videos. One of the major silences or absences that we see is the fact that none of the Spanish language promotional material like the websites and the brochures none of that stuff is actually available in Spanish despite the fact that Utah has a huge Latinx and Spanish speaking population something like 13% of the whole state population clearly Spanish speaking parents were not the intended audience of this promotional material and yes we could point out that perhaps the other languages do not get translations either but that kind of just proves the point even further. Utah dual language programs are not trying to attract parents whose children do not already know English. The marketing material is aimed at the English speaking parents of the world languages constituency, not the equity heritage constituency. Also, something notable in the Spanish language brochure is where it says, you'll be delighted how quickly your child becomes a comfortable and competent Spanish speaker. Okay, so what's interesting here is that in the written policy, it says these programs are supposed to be populated with at least half native speaking children. Whether that happens or not is a different story. But in this example, that phrasing silences or erases the existence of all the kids who show up to that DL program already knowing Spanish as their first language. Okay, so this article goes over tons of examples just like that. But I wanna cover what the authors say about the promotional video Utah disseminated. I already showed you a couple clips from this video earlier. Basically, Utah produced a 10 minute video titled Speaking in Tongues, Utah short version, where it seems like they took some excerpts from an hour long documentary named Speaking in Tongues. The original documentary itself confronts the politics of language education in the United States. It features tons of diverse children and parents and talks honestly about the struggles of immigrants in American schools. So here's a couple seconds from the documentary. Oh, and kind of listen to that dark, ominous soundtrack that's playing. Now we're voting on the resolution, preparing all students for a multilingual, multicultural world. Encontrar una escuela para mi hija donde aprenda más inglés. La verdad es que a mí, a mí no me interesa que mi hija aprenda puro español, porque el español yo se lo enseño. In America, we should speak English. I don't think I should be paying my taxes for someone else to learn the language. America is rapidly becoming a Tower of Babel. Okay, so Utah's version of speaking in tongues does not look anything like that. It seems like what Utah did was take some excerpts from this documentary and then edited a promo video that takes on a very business focused and inspirational tone. This is a real leg up in economic development to have a population that can be fluent in speaking a multiplicity of foreign languages. Utah is being talked about all over the United States um, because we're doing something that no one else is doing. These immersion programs are just adding to our already, I think, appeal to the business community. We have to have that one, that one edge that makes us stand out uh, more so than anybody else. And Utah has that with the dual immersion program. In this video, Utah silenced almost all of the political stuff because political disputes about race and immigration and foreign languages is not something Utah wanted to focus on in their promotional marketing material. In fact, the video makes the explicit claim that Utah takes a non-political approach to second language learning. Immersion programs are just adding to our already I think appeal to the business community. The state has not made it a political issue. Lots of people want to strengthen language learning these days for many reasons. Maybe it's for all these reasons, but it's all good. I think we see an economic purpose in being open to the world that we hope will uh, present a competitive advantage for Utahns. There is no program that is tied greater to future economic development in Utah than the dual immersion. So program. even though the video acknowledges the political process and even features politicians in the promo, the video asserts it's not a political issue. In other words, this is a silencing of all the political debates 
that are concerned with educational equity. So we got tons of references to business and the claim that bilingual education is not political and nonstop images of white looking children. Now look, language learning in the United States has always revolved around ideologies of race and nationalism and anti-immigrant sentiment, especially when Spanish is involved in the conversation. In the United States, the Spanish language invokes some serious paranoia from certain monolingual English-speaking folks. I mean, I've never heard anyone scream, this is America, stop speaking French. But you will hear things like, stop speaking Mexican. This is not to say that other languages have not been historically stigmatized. It's just that languages are stigmatized differently in different places with differing degrees of potency depending on the historical conditions. And so to review, we have two main constituencies. We got folks who want to prioritize educational equity and heritage language maintenance, where we can predict that most of the Latinx folks will likely be. Then we have folks who want children to learn a second language in order to become more competitive on the job market. Now, as we've seen, the world languages constituency was centered and prioritized both in the written policy and in the marketing. And even though Utah has a big Latinx population, their interests were effectively deprioritized. Utah has successfully popularized dual language programs and other states are taking notes. But the central strategy appears to be to gain support from politicians and business institutions, as well as recruit parents and children from already dominant populations. This simply does not resemble the old school civil rights era motivations and strategies for legitimizing bilingual education in the United States. It sounds more like an effort to make already privileged children more competitive, meaning not unless we make changes to the policy, to the marketing, and to the pedagogy, there will likely be little change to the status quo. Well, that's all for today, folks. Don't forget to like and subscribe. You can look up all my publications on academia.edu. And of course, a big shout out to my Patreon supporters. This is Mike with the Social Life of Language. And we're done.